Hey, good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning, Convent Avenue Baptist Church family. This is a day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing, and we're glad to be in it. Thank you for joining us today. Today is a special day in the life of our church family. This is Youth Day. It's Youth Day. You know what time it is. So we are blessed today to be under the leadership of the youth of the church, uh, who are directed by our Minister of Children and Youth, the Reverend Alama Z. Warren. We're looking forward to this awesome time in worship and praise. A special welcome to Pastor Vernon Gordon, who's going to share with us today, who's also a part of our Lot Carey family. But anyway, let's prepare to get into this Word of God, get into this worship experience, to participate and be blessed as our youth lead us. God bless you. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Today's scripture is taken from Psalms 8, verses 1 through 10, and I'm reading from the New Living's translation. O Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth, your glory is higher than the heavens. You have told children and infants to tell of your strength, silencing your enemies and all who oppose you. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care of them, Yet you made them only a little lower than God, and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the currents. O oh Lord, our Lord, your majestic name fills the earth. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our grief and sins to bear. Oh, what a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Most gracious and eternal Father God, we come this morning, dear God, thanking you, dear Father God, for your allow us to see another youth Sunday, dear Father God. And we just thank you for last night laying down, dear God. Oh, Heavenly Father, we ask you this morning, dear Father God, to prepare our hearts and our mind to receive your holy word, dear Father God. And Father God, we just ask you, dear God, let your word penetrate deep into our soul, dear Father God, and into our hearts, dear Father God. And Father God, may we not just be hearer of your word, but we do of your word, dear Father God. And may something that is said here this morning, dear Father God, transform our mind, dear Father God. And may the word of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning again, brothers and sisters in Christ. Pastor Jesse Williams here with a few pastoral observations for us on this Youth Day. First, I want to continue to encourage you to please use personal protective equipment. Wear a mask that covers both your nose and mouth. Continue to practice social distancing and engage in hand washing and hand sanitizing. It's important that we continue to do our part to stop the spread of the COVID virus. Secondly, I've been asked to remind those of you who give your tithes and offerings on the electronic platforms, that is, if you use Givelify or PayPal or Cash App or at conventchurch.org, please make sure that your envelope number is included in your memo as you give it electronically. We want to make sure that we're able to give a accurate accounting of all contributions of tithes and offerings. And again, tithes and offerings is available to give for members as well as non-members of the congregation. If you are following this ministry from wherever you are in the world, yes, you are invited to give to be a blessing to this ministry. Lastly, I just wanted to say that early voting has started in the state of New York. Again, early voting has started in the state of New York. It started on October the 24th, which was yesterday. So I'm making a call today for all of us who can to go out and vote early, and you can do it today. We can take souls to the polls today and go vote today. I hope you already know where you're supposed to vote, and I hope you have a strategy, and I hope you're taking someone with you as you go to vote. So again, let's get out there and vote early and make our voice known. Well, that's all for now. May God bless you and keep you. Take care. Good morning. My name is Sierra Chevelle Anderson Williams, and I will be bringing forth the Youth Day emphasis. This year, I lost, won, failed, cried, laughed, loved, but most of all, I learned. The most important lesson I learned is God gives his toughest battles to his strongest soldiers. When the city closed down, it was the spring semester of my junior year. I was about to endure on so many opportunities and journeys as a junior, but God had other plans. Switching from live school to virtual school was an adjustment for me, but I was able to adapt quickly because I reminded myself of Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Within one month of quarantine, I got sick with COVID-19. There were days I couldn't get out of bed to perform daily tasks, but I still managed to show up for all my classes and do my work on time because the Lord stood with me and gave me strength. 2 Timothy 4.17. Now, if that's not faith in the Lord, I don't know what is. I was sick for about three weeks, and it was one of the scariest moments of my life. There were days I cried because I didn't know if I was going to wake up and see another day, but I kept faith that God had a plan for me. Three weeks later, I bounced back to myself, but not aware of how COVID-19 affected my respiratory system, considering I have asthma. Now I have to carry asthma pumps and do breathing treatments when necessary. Ultimately, I'm now a walking testimony of having COVID-19 and beating it. In conclusion to my junior year, I passed with a 90 overall average. I passed my advanced placement exam with a four, earning college credit, and received honor roll for the last two quarters. All I could do was give glory and praise to God because I can't tell you how I battled COVID-19 and still did all my work on time for school. Two weeks after finishing school, I got the devastating news that my grandpa died and my world stopped. I didn't have a father growing up and my grandpa filled that role and more. My grandpa was my everything from the time he took me in at 16 days old so my mom could go back to finish school. My grandpa moved back to Georgia in December of 2017 and I was supposed to visit him in April for spring break until COVID hit. After getting the news, a part of me felt guilty because I never got the chance to visit him until it was too late. Out of all the deaths I've endured, this was one of the hardest ones, which led me to seek out the Lord and want to get closer with him. Now, every night before I go to sleep, I write in my journal, listen to my favorite gospel songs, and pray to a picture of my grandpa. Lately, I felt like my grandpa and the Lord have been watching over me and sending me blessings. I'm currently a senior in high school. My workload has increased picking up advanced placement classes again, partaking in the college process and extracurriculars. 
I have a college list of 33 schools in total and 19 of them being historically black colleges and universities. Now that I am building a better relationship with the Lord, he chose to send me a blessing on October 1st with my first college acceptance into Langston University. When I got the, when I got the letter, all I could do was cry because this is what I've been working so hard for since freshman year. Again, all I could do was give glory and praise to the Lord. That night, I recited, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. Luke 1, 45. All I kept thinking was that my grandpa was looking down on me smiling. Reflecting on this year, I found myself asking, why did this happen to me or what did I do to deserve this? But I had to stop questioning God's plan for me. Instead, I started to look back at all the lessons and messages I learned from each situation. I realized that God was preparing me for future situations to come. All the lessons I've learned this year will be useful for me as I prepare to start this new journey of my life. I've learned that I need to protect my peace of mind, sanity, and energy. I also learned that if I don't have anyone else by my side, I have the Lord. On my journey of getting closer with the Lord, I noticed that I started to give him more thanks in my prayers and ask for specific lessons to learn. I also recognize that there are many traits that I have that I want to adjust and there are traits I want but lack. However, what is meant for me will be for me in due time. I've grown to love the smart, beautiful young lady I am today, despite my flaws, and I owe all of that to the Lord and my experiences that he's laid at my feet. I know that I will go off to college next fall. I won't physically be here in convent, but I will seek out another church home to still hear the Lord's word. I'm thankful for all the lessons, the memories, and the experiences I've had here at convent. I'm also appreciative of all the members here at Convent who have taken a chance on me and guided me in the right direction. I'm grateful for the programs I participated in, such as Saturday Children's Fellowship, the Youth Ministry, and the Children and Youth Usher Board, where I have been president for the last two years. I'm confident that I will be able to apply the lessons that Convent has taught me. The takeaway I want to leave you with is no matter what hardship you encounter, it doesn't last forever. And if you put your faith in the Lord, he will lead you right into your blessings. What time is it, Convent? You got that right. It's offering time. It's that moment in service where we worship God through our giving. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7, Whosoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whosoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Here at Covenant Avenue Baptist Church, you can give cheerfully through text to give, and then you could also do it through Cash App, as well as through our church website, or you may also mail in your contribution. As we continue to worship God cheerfully, we pray that God will continue to bless you and your family, for God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> Listen, I am so excited today because it is Youth Sunday. Woo! And today we have with us Pastor Vernon Gordon, uh, who is the leading pastor of the Life Church of Richmond, Virginia. Not only is he the leading pastor of the Life Church, but he is also the president of the Lot Carey Foreign Mission Youth Division. We are so excited for him to be here. The youth has been asking for years for us to, to get Pastor Gordon, and I tell you, he is here, Convent Avenue Baptist Church. So following a selection from our chosen youth choir, the next voice you will hear is Pastor Vernon Gordon. Let's receive him, Convent, as we hear this mighty word from God from Pastor Vernon.
What's going on, family? I am so excited to be with you today on this amazing celebration of youth at your church, Convent Avenue Baptist Church. It is a privilege to be with you. My name is Pastor Vernon Gordon, all the way here from Richmond, Virginia, but my heart is close with you today as I continue to keep you in my prayers, and I'm so excited to visit you soon when the time is Right, but I want to take this time to acknowledge and just recognize the amazing shepherd and leader of your amazing ministry. Uh, Can you join me in celebrating Pastor Reverend Dr. Jesse Williams? I am so grateful for his example in my life. I had the privilege of serving in Lot Carey leadership with him. And let me tell you something, you have one of the greatest pastors this side of heaven. I have learned so much from his example, his voice, and his leadership, and I'm grateful uh, that he is uh, one of the best, I know you know this already, but let me just tell you, one of the greatest and best leaders this side of heaven. As you're celebrating him, would you join me in celebrating as well his lovely wife, First Lady Williams. We bless you. Thank you so much again to both of you for the opportunity to be here today and to share with such an amazing congregation. I also want to take the moment and shout out my boy, Reverend Z. Warren, and the entire youth ministry team for allowing me to be a part of this day. We've been talking about this for years, literally. They saw me at Lot Carry two years ago and was like, hey, man, you got to come to Convent Avenue. And I was like, absolutely. And then last year they asked me for this year. And then I said, I'm all locked in. And then COVID happened. But let me tell you something, Convent, we are family from afar. And I can't wait to continue to stay close. But I just want to shout out Reverend Z for being so consistent and saying, hey, man, we got to have you a part of this moment. Thank you for being a brother. Thank you for being a friend. Thank you to the entire youth ministry team for allowing me to be here today. And then I got to make sure I get one other shout out, man. I, my boy Jesse, my boy Jesse, I, I guess little Jesse in y'all context, man. Shouts out to Jesse Williams, man. It's been such a joy to see you grow over the years uh, throughout Lot Carey. And, uh, and I'm still waiting for you. You told me you was coming. You was going to do an internship here in Virginia. I'm still waiting for you to come on and do the internship here in Virginia. Come on with it, man. So look, I am so excited today because I know that, that this is going to be a time where we start to recognize where where we go from here, uh, the message and the meaning of carrying the gospel of Jesus. And one of the things that I want you to know today is that as we step into this conversation, we're going to start this conversation by looking at some teenagers who changed the world. We're going to start this conversation today looking at some young adults and some people who weren't maybe old enough, but yet Jesus chose them. Their names were people like Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, and and James and, and John, you might have known them as the disciples. These were young adults and teenagers who came alongside Jesus and eventually changed the world after Jesus' departure. And with this in mind, I want to bring our attention to the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Again, Matthew, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Here's what the NIV version says. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, He withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. He directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Now, it's enough to just talk about what Jesus did to feed 5,000 people, but I think it's important that we understand how the disciples end up in this picture and their part or narrative in this storyline. So run really quickly, I want you to go with me to Mark chapter 6 as well. Mark chapter 6, and I'm going to read really quickly verses 30 through 33. It says this, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. 
Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. And got there ahead of them. People got there ahead of them. Would you bow? I just want to pray for us. Lord, we recognize that your word is full of wisdom for our lives. And so we ask now, God, that as we seek out the ways in which to live a fulfilled life, but also share this life of fulfillment with others, to carry the message of the gospel and the meaning of Jesus' gospel. We pray now that you would just have your way in our hearts and have your way in our minds and have your way in these moments that we might be better as we are pricked and prodded and moved to progress through your word. I pray now, God, that they not see my face or hear my voice, but only see and hear the voice and face of you that lives in me. I decrease as you increase. Have your way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said together, amen. I want to preach today from this simple thought. If you're taking notes, please write this down. It's in your hands. It's in your hands. You know, my wife and I uh, moved into a new home about a year ago. And as we moved into this new home, I was extremely excited. But one of the things that was off about the home is that my wife uh, wanted the, the room, some of the rooms to be a different color. She wanted them to be repainted. Like the good husband I am, I said, no problem, boo. You know, I was raised by one of those dads. They said, you take care of it. You know, you make it happen. So I said, no problem. I got you. And so I decided that I was going go to go to Lowe's and get the paint and paint the rooms myself. Well, as I began to prepare to paint, I saw my wife struggling. I saw something that she needed to say. She said, babe, please don't paint the rooms. I said, babe, why not? You know, at our last house, I painted our daughter's room, and, and, and I painted our bedroom over. And, and babe, I painted, I painted the, the basement one time. I did an accent wall, and I painted the, the downstairs bathroom. Like, babe, I did all of that. And she looked back at me and said something that, 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 that caught me by surprise. She said, babe, I know, I know, but I've never liked any of those paint jobs. I said, excuse me? I said, wait, 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 wait. I said, I painted all four of those rooms. I put my heart and soul into them, and you're sitting here telling me that years later, you never liked them. She said, yeah, I talked to my friends about it and talked to my mom, but, but you had already done it, so I just let you have that moment. But, but we're in this new house, and, and I just, I just, mm, babe, painting is not your strong suit. And this kind of pattern continued, you know, she started to help me to understand, like, I, I tried to do some plumbing work in our new house. I tried to do some plumbing work. I was like, I'm going to take care of it, babe. Toilet messed up. Don't worry about it. I got it. And she was like, babe, that just never really worked out. Done some landscaping work, and, and it just never really worked out. I've, I've done some different things that I thought my hands were doing a good job. And here's what was interesting about all of that. Uh, uh, through all of that, I thought my wife was expecting me to be good with my hands. And, and now we've reached a point in our marriage nine years in where I recognize this, that she is not expecting me to be good with my hands. Yeah, there's some times where I got to step up. There's some times I got to do some stuff. But, but, but by and large, she knows we're on the same page. And I got to call somebody. Here's what I want you to understand today. Here's what I want you to understand today. I have no regrets, though, about all the work that I've done with my hands. I have no regrets for trying. Here's why. Because there's a simple principle that I think we all can take away today. The work of your hands will tell the values of your heart. Let me say it again. The work of your hands always tell the values of your heart. If you really want to tell somebody where your heart is, here's the question we should ask. What if your hands went to work to do? Have I seen your hands go to work? And do the work of your hands confirm the values of your heart? Let me just prove this to you 
in a few different ways. I mean, if you're saying, Vernon, I don't believe it. Cool, cool, cool. Let's talk about a couple of examples. Uh, if you've ever known somebody who was moving before uh, and you invite them to help you move, you know, people come up with excuses out of the blue when it's time to move. You'll be like, ah, I got, um, I got, mm, I got a thing that I got to do, right? I know there's some teenagers who always get called on. They're like, oh, you, you strong. You know what I'm saying? You, uh, yeah, you know, you, you young. You, you, you. No, uh, there's some of us who have friends who moving and they say, can you be there? And you're like, I got, you know, my back. Whatever it is, you can see who's there, who shows up, puts their hands to work with you. All right, all right. This is for 20 people. This is for 20 people who I know y'all been saved all your life. You've been saved all your life. And you ain't never needed Jesus to deliver you from fighting, from throwing hands. Come on here. Can I get an amen right there in the chat? Uh, but there's a few of us. There's a few of us who had a life before Jesus. Uh, and we can be honest about the fact uh, that there were some moments when a friend called you. And you were the type of friend that you ain't need to know what we were fighting for. You ain't need to know who did it, when they did it, why they did it. But when your friend called you, you was like, who's ready to get these what? Hands. I'm ready to put these hands on you. Uh, I'm ready to do what I got to do to step up for my friend. I'll throw hands for my friend. And you knew who your real friends were in a moment of conflict, in a moment of controversy. Some folk found their way out of the fight. Some folk found their way into the fight with you. They said, I will use my hands. They, they, there's these work of our hands that tell the values of our heart. In other words, principle is this. I can show you better than I can tell you. I can show you better than I can tell you. As we begin to think about the gospel, I know some of y'all are saying, Vernon, where is this going? Stay with me. It's important that we understand that I believe the same thing applies to the work of Jesus in our lives. That there are times when Jesus says, do the work of your hands confirm the values of your heart. Will you fight with me to bring the kingdom of heaven from earth as it is in heaven? Will, will, will you stand with me? Will you lift the heavy loads with me? Will you, will you pull up and say what needs to be moved and shifted in our culture so that something can be repositioned so that the world can be blessed by the message of Jesus? Whatever it is that somebody can be moved into a life of fulfillment in Jesus, I need you to understand today that it's in our hands that we can show better than we can tell. And it's in this reality that I think we all have to ask ourselves, does my life confirm the value I have for Jesus? I, I, I'm confident that as I speak to many of you today, that that stands true. But, but as we begin to think about a season that has been unprecedented, I'd be remiss if I didn't look at the context and the reality by which this sermon is coming to you in. The reality of it is there's some things happening in our world and in our communities and in our country and in the life around us that, that has all of us asking the question, how do we do the work of Jesus now? How do we advance the gospel now? How do we pay attention to what God might want to do next in our lives and in our church and through our friendships and through our neighbors and, and through our communities and through our schools, whatever it is? How do we connect to what Jesus wants to do now? After a season of disappointment, after a season of confusion, after a season of uncertainty, after a season of, of, of trying to figure it all out, after a season of delay and what might feel like sometimes denial, after a season of not having everything work out the way the vision board planned it out in January, in this season, how do we connect with the plan of Jesus to bring life and fulfillment and fullness and joy and peace to the world around us. Here's what I love about this particular passage. If you allow me to teach for just two seconds, whenever we look at scripture, I think it's important that we look at the topography around the text. And, and in this particular passage, we see something very interesting. A couple things. First, we have to look at the story chronologically. Right before this, Jesus is just taking the disciples, taking the disciples, and he's appointed them to apostles. Okay, watch this. So he's made them apostles, which means in the Greek, ones who are sent forth with the power of the one who sent them. And so Jesus sends them out to do miracles, to heal the sick, to, to raise the dead, to do all the things that he had been doing by example. And then he says, y'all go out 
and do the same. So, so right before this, the disciples have went out and now they have returned after being given authority and apostleship. Now they've returned to Jesus to tell them about all that they have done. But it's also important to note, this is the first time they are gathering since that time and they've been working, they've been serving, they've been pushing, they've been adapting, they've been innovating, they've been trying to figure it out, they've been trying to stay positive, they've been trying to stay encouraged. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And now they reach this point where they're tired, they're hungry, they want a Popeye's chicken sandwich. They said, I need a break. They want some food and just to calm down, rest, and relax. And it's in this reality that we see the disciples' humanity and their fatigue. Remember, these are teenagers and young adult men who have taken this bold and courageous call to follow Jesus. And then they find themselves tired, hungry, ready to rest. And they follow Jesus to a solitary place a place that is supposed to be about them. Don't miss it. This is supposed to be their moment. It's supposed to be the time when it's about their needs. This is supposed to be the time when it's supposed to be about their ask. This is supposed to be the time when it's about their questions and their concerns. This is their moment. They're with Jesus. Get in a boat. Go to a solitary place. And then the only thing they find when they get there, more work to be done. They arrive, and there are people there who need Jesus to heal them. And after Jesus finishes healing them, people get hungry. It gets dark. And the disciples reasonably say, oh, gee, I think we need to send these people away so they can go get something to eat. And Jesus flips the whole script here. And what Jesus does next, I believe, sets the tone for what discipleship not only has looked like, whether you've been in ministry for years or whether you are new to the faith, whatever your context, Jesus sets the tone right here for what we all have to wrestle with in this season. Jesus says, don't send them away. You feed them. Hmm. But Jesus, I'm tired. You feed them. But Jesus, I need a rest. You feed them. But Jesus, I got issues going on in my life. You feed them. But Jesus, I've been, I've been serving. I've been singing in the choir, and I've been ushering, and I've been doing it. You feed them. Profound implications. Is Jesus not here? Their fatigue? Is Jesus not aware of where they are? Or could Jesus be trying to set a tone and an example for what all of us have to wrestle with as a reality, what it means to be carriers of the gospel for the next generation? Look at it. Three things I believe that Jesus shows us that the passage promotes to us as a way for us to live our lives. First thing is this. Jesus invites our participation, but not our preferences. Ugh. I know I might not get an invitation back. I know I might not get an invitation back. I'm so sorry. I just got to tell you. Jesus invites our participation, but unfortunately, he doesn't invite their preferences. Here they are. Saying, Jesus, my preference would be that you send them away so that we can get our own moment and our own time because we were ready to spend some time with you. Jesus. And he says, yeah, but I want you to participate, but, but, but not your preference. And here's what I love about Jesus. God wants us to see that we have power and our focus should be about using that power for others and not just serving ourselves. Here's what's crazy. I don't think Jesus needed their help. If Jesus can talk to seas and calm them down, I'm pretty sure Jesus is good without their help. If Jesus can bring dead people back to life, I'm sure he didn't need their help. If Jesus has the ability to make 
blind people see and lame people walk. I'm pretty sure he didn't need the help. I believe that Jesus invites their participation so he can help them to see that there will be moments in your ministry beyond my presence here where you're going to be tired, where it's not going to be ideal, where you're going to be hurt, where you're going to feel like I can't go another step, I can't go another moment, and you're going to have to pull from deep within and say no, but as long as God is inside of me, as long as I have the Holy Spirit, there is nothing that I cannot do, that the kingdom still has souls to win, that there's still opportunities to change the world, there's still opportunities to break through chains and addictions and struggles that people may be having, that people need to be fed physically and spiritually. And there's something that I can do to participate in what Jesus Jesus is trying to do in the earth, but it requires sometimes us to push beyond our preferences. And that's not always easy. Got to be honest with you. It's not what all of us would desire at times. Here's what I think is so interesting in church that we often do. We, we often interpret the story and integrate ourselves into the stories as the ones being fed not the ones doing the feeding. It's easy to shout on this passage when Jesus is the one multiplying for us. What happens when Jesus invites your participation to be the multiplier for others? Preferences. Preferences. You know, I got to be honest with you. Um, I have two children now, uh, Madison and Jackson, uh, who are six and four, respectively. And uh, with a six and four-year-old, Here's what I've learned about having kids. Can I tell you what I learned about having kids? They don't care about my preferences at all. Uh, no matter what I do, they don't care about if I'm tired. They don't care about if I had a long day. They don't care about if I had been traveling and preaching. They don't care if I just wrote a book. <laughs> they don't care who I was just with. All they know is that daddy's home is time to play. That's it. My son runs up now, and, and he is in his head a superhero at all times. He puts his blanket on top of his head, and he shows up, and he's like, Daddy's home. And he'll, he don't care about what just happened. He is ready to fight. He's ready to run. He's ready to wrestle. He is not caring about my preferences. And you know what? Here's what's interesting. Nine times out of ten, I push through. I push through my pain, my, my fatigue, my, my exhaustion, my frustration of the day. You know why? Because when our hands come together and we're wrestling, when our hands are high-fiving, when we're pounding, when we're playing, I'm recognizing that it's in my hands that I communicate the values of my heart. I want to let you know something today. There are going to be some opportunities in this next season for us to show the world where our heart really is. But it requires us to say, no, I got to feed them. God is inviting my participation into the work of changing lives. Here's the second thing, though. Second thing, though. Jesus invites us to see opportunity and not obstacles. Watch this. He invites us to see opportunity and not obstacles. Here's what's crazy. Everybody else sees a problem. Jesus sees a possibility. Let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. Here are the disciples. They was like, Jesus is getting late. We don't got no food. Send them away. Jesus' response. You feed them. Okay. No problem. I got, I got one for you. So I, the disciples got together. And they, they huddled up. They said, look, uh, Jesus wants us to feed these people. Uh, but I got it, guys. I got it, guys. We ain't got no food. We'll tell him that. He'll send the people away. Jesus, we ain't got no food. Jesus' response, ah, problem. Go find whatever you can. Okay. So, 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 so Peter and James, John, John and James, they get together. And, uh, and it had to be Peter that did this because Peter is the hood one. You know, you remember Peter cut off ears, and Peter, Peter always had a little problem. Peter had some issues. And so here's Peter. Peter found a little boy. Had to be Peter. Had to be Peter. And stole his lunch. I mean, that's pretty much what happened in the text. Like, Peter looked at this little boy and was like, oh, you got five loaves, two fish? Cool. Uh, let me get those up off you. And after Peter hijacks his little boy lunch, 
he says to the disciples, hey, don't worry about it. I got it figured out, guys. Like, Jesus surely now is going to send the people away. Because all we got is this little bit. See, goes to Jesus. Um, Jesus, here you go. This is all that we have. It's a problem. We don't have enough. Jesus says, give me what you have. At this point, I imagine the disciples had to be in confusion. Because we told Jesus it's getting late and it's getting dark. We told Jesus we didn't have no food. We found only a little bit of food that we took off of a little boy. Surely Jesus will not keep going down this path. But the thing that Jesus invites us to see when we are believers is possibilities and not just the problems. He invites us to see opportunities and not just the obstacles. And so Jesus takes what little they have, he breaks it, he blesses it, and it starts to multiply. Here's what I love about Jesus. There are moments in your life where Jesus is going to allow you to come up against an obstacle, not because he wants you to feel defeated, but because he wants you to know that greater is he that's within you than he that is within the world, that there is power within you that is greater than you even understand, that there is potential in you that goes beyond what your mama said about you, what your daddy said about you, what neighborhood you come from, what economic class you're in, what neighborhood you live in, whatever it is, Jesus says, don't see the problem, see the possibility. Don't see the obstacle, see the opportunity. Jesus says, little is much when you place it in my hands. And so Jesus starts to go to work. I don't know if anybody loves food the way I do. All my people who love food, let me just see you say something in the chat. Be like, that's me. I, I love food. I, I don't even matter what kind of food it is. I just love eating. Can I get an amen, somebody? I love food eating. I love trying food. I love, I love uh, eating. I love buffets. Come on here. There's, there's nothing like God created like a good buffet. Let me tell you some Chinese and give me a good American cuisine and give me some Italian. I'll eat all the time if you let me. I love food. And, and, and particularly, there's nothing like a home-cooked meal. I just, man, like you can take me to any restaurant in the world, but, but it's something about a home-cooked meal that does something to your life, man. And, and let me tell you something. When I uh, uh, got to college, I didn't know how much I missed home-cooked meals. Well, it gets real interesting here because I believe that throughout my life, I've encountered two types of home-cooked meals. There are two types of cooks, two types of cooks that we all know about. There's one type of cook who needs all of their specifications. They need everything that they ask for to be there. If they don't have just the right ingredients, just the right stuff, just the way, the way they make it, they can't fulfill the promise of that meal that you're looking forward to, right? They're like, uh-uh, I don't got what I need. I don't got my special stuff, right? Cool. And then there is the cook. Who can take whatever you got? I got a couple friends like this. They walk in my kitchen, and they're amazing cooks. And they say, oh, you got a little bit of that? A little bit of this. Let me grab that. Ooh, yeah, I could work with that. And they put it all together. And it doesn't matter what I had when the meal comes out. It is everything I needed. It is satisfactory on every level. And every time I'm amazed, I'm saying, how did you take what little I had and do so much with it. Can I tell you something today? Jesus wants to come into your life and he says, you keep worrying about what you have and I keep telling you to just give it to me. And if you give it to me, I'm going to do something amazing. Can I tell you something? God is going to do something amazing through your church when we start giving it to him. He's going to start saying, hey, I want to do more than you ever imagined, exceedingly and abundantly above all you could ask or think. God wants to do something through your personal discipleship in Christianity in a way that you can never imagine and beyond anything you could ask or think. But what does it require? It requires us to stop presenting the obstacle to Jesus and start seeing the opportunity. Stop staring at the problem and start saying, no, 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 I have the possibility maker in my midst. It's in this that Jesus challenges the disciples' vision for what is possible when you trust Jesus with what you have. Here's the last thing, though. last thing Jesus does is Jesus invites us to make miracles, not excuses. Jesus is a multiplier. But here's the part that's always blessed me. Not just that Jesus did a miracle. It's where the miracle 
happen. I, 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 this blew my mind when I see it. I don't know if anybody's ever noticed this before. But I always thought the miracle happened in the hands of Jesus. Jesus takes the bread. He blesses it. And then it says something very significant. He gives it back to the disciples. Hmm. And then it says, as they distributed it, it multiplied. Did y'all see that in the text? It literally said that Jesus gave them the bread. Then the disciples gave it to the people. And as they gave it out, it multiplied in their hands. Not in Jesus' hands, in the disciples' hands. And I begin to think about this, that it's in the hands of the disciples that multiplication happens. In other words, I came to let you know today that your hands have the power to change the world. Your hands have the power to change your community. Your hands have the power to change a neighborhood. Your hands have the power to change a political system. You may be pastoring the next president. You may be pastoring the next Congress leader. You may be pastoring the next activist. You may be pastoring the next scientist. You are pastoring the next doctors and lawyers and physicians. We are pastoring the next generation. So I need you to understand today that that, that there's a future. Beyond what has been, there is a future. And it's in your hands. I've heard some people say, Man, the church is never going to be the same after this. I believe that's not true. I just believe that God is going to work with those who have the ability to see not just the problems but the possibilities, not just the obstacles but the opportunities. And when they do, when they put it in God's hands, he's going to give them something back that they're going to say, now in my hands, God is trusting me to be a multiplier. Take what he's given me, the gifts, the abilities, the strengths, the interest, the artistic ability, the wisdom, stewardship, whatever it is, it's in my hands to multiply impact and influence and mission to bring people into living a fulfilled life, to bring people into finding Jesus, to bring people into trusting God again, to bring people into having confidence in themselves, to bring people into hope and peace, and joy. It's in our hands. It's in your hands. And here's what I love. Here's what I love. Throughout this sermon, I know I may not get an invitation back because you may say, Vernon, this seems real heavy. Like, you're putting all the onus on us. I think the church is the hope of the world right now more than ever before. The church is the hope of communities. It's the hope of neighborhoods. It's the hope of our country. It's the hope of generations. My children will be the recipients of the type of churches that we build and the type of kingdom movement we start. But here's what I love about the passage. Maybe you're saying, Vernon, it seems a little heavy. Here's what I love about Jesus. He never forgets about you. See, when we started this, we talked about the disciples, and they get there, and they're tired, and they're hungry. And they want to rest. And it would seem like Jesus forgets about them. But then it says something at the end. It says Jesus tells them to go and collect the leftovers. And when they do, they collect 12 baskets full. It's important to understand that the Greek word here for these baskets is kofinos, which is a military term. It would have been the equivalent to a week's worth of provision for anybody who was in the armed forces at the time. In other words, Jesus doesn't just give them a basket to feed them for a moment. 
He gives them something to feed them for a week. He gives them something that will last. He gives them something that is sustainable. Jesus didn't forget about them. It was through their serving. It was through their mission-mindedness. It was through them fulfilling purpose and walking in their potential that they actually made a way for their own provision, for their own possibility, for their own future. Jesus took care of them as they used their hands because the work of your hands. Show the value of your heart. It was in the leftovers that they found all they need. You know, I'll tell you my quick testimony and I'm going to be done. For those who don't know me personally, I was a former cancer patient diagnosed with two tumors, 13 surgeries, three years of chemotherapy. They told me I would die three times. I'm standing here today because the God that we serve is real and he loves you cares for you and deeply wants a relationship with you. The truth of the matter is this. There were moments in that journey where I said, God, do you see me? Do you hear me? Where are you? I'm looking for you. I need you. But can I tell you, God has never failed me. And the more I've used my testimony and my time my heart and my hands to serve him. He's never let me down. Matter of fact, he's done more than I could have ever imagined. And maybe you're somebody today saying, Vernon, I, my, my story's not cancer, but, but I'm in my own struggle. I'm in my own place. I'm like the disciples. I'm showing up to this tired from the last eight months, tired from loneliness in, in this season, tired from dealing with the crises, tired from dealing with the pandemic, whatever it is. I want you to notice today, God has not forgotten about you and that there's still work in you that God is going to use to change the world around you. It's in your hands. So don't let the enemy rob you the confidence of who you are and what you're called to be. I want to pray for you now, if you would allow me. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be reminded that the work that you want to do in the earth is in our hands. And yes, we know we have to give all that we have and all that we are to you first. But that which is blessed, you give back to us, and then we have to put our hand to the plow and not look back. So God, I pray right now that every single person under the sound of my voice, no matter what generation they are, no matter what neighborhood they come from, no matter their background, no matter their context or construct, that we would all ask ourselves the pivotal question, what is God setting my hands to do? And when the opportunity presents itself, may we see the opportunity and not just the obstacles. May we be willing to participate with God in doing the work of miracles all around us and not just pursue our preferences. And may we be willing to say, Lord, there are miracles that you're calling me to be a part of, not to make excuses, but to say, Lord, I'm ready. This next season is going to be my best season of serving you. And I believe that God is about to take us all to another level in our hands. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love you all. Thank you again so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Blessings to you, and I can't wait to see you really soon. Wow, what a mighty word from Pastor Gordon. Listen, I told you guys, you were getting ready to receive a mighty word from God. We thank Pastor Gordon for that word. Perhaps there's someone here today that would like to get connected with this Jesus Christ that Pastor Gordon just preached about. We would pray that you would inbox us on Facebook, or you may also email us. Perhaps you're saying, well, Reverend Z, I'm already connected to, to Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, but I do not have a church home. Well, listen, this is a great place to be. This is a great place where you may grow. Inbox us so we can get you connected with Jesus Christ as well as your personal Lord and Savior. And perhaps there might be someone that says, hey, I'm just here for school. I'm not going to be here long. I just need to be under a covering. 
please inbox us because we would love for you to make convent your, your covering as you're here in school. And perhaps there's someone that says, Reverend Z, I want to get saved right now. What I'm going to do, I am going to lead you through the sinner's prayer. And I need you to know that God can save you instantly. He has that kind of power. And perhaps that's you today. So bow your head as we continue, um, as I lead you through the sinner's prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this awesome opportunity to just say thank you. God, we accept you as our personal Lord and Savior. And we believe that you have risen Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. God, we confess that we are sinners. And we confess that we want you to come in our heart and save us. But most of all, God, we want you to be our God. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Just like that, I need you to know that you are saved. Please inbox us today because we would love for you to get connected. Uh, perhaps there's someone in worship you say, well, Reverend Z, I'm already connected, uh, but I need prayer. If that's you today, I pray that you would bow your heads as we come together as a church and as a body of Christ and pray together. Let's bow our heads. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity just to say thank you. Thank you for being a God who hears and answers our prayers. We thank you for that word that came from Pastor Gordon on today. God, we come asking right now that you would help and, and work on us. God, we thank you for being a God that's of mercy, a God of peace, a God of hope, a God of love, a God of joy. God, restore our joy right now. For we've been shelter in place and some of us haven't come out since the pandemic started. But God, we come asking right now that you would not give us a, fear, a spirit of fear, but you would give us a spirit of faith. God, we come asking right now that you would continue to be the God of refuge and strength during our time of trouble. God, we come asking right now that there's someone who needs their rent to be paid, that you would pay it, God. God, we come asking right now that you'd watch over that person that do not know you on today that needs to get to know you. God, we come asking right now that they would come into the understanding of who you are, God. Perhaps there's someone that's dealing with depression, someone that's dealing with domestic violence, someone that's dealing with all different kind of things, God, and we need you to intervene. We need you to heal. We need you to deliver. We need you to be a protector, God. We continue to ask that you would sustain us, and most of all, that you would continue to be our God. God, we come asking right now, people are needing healing, those who are in the midst of um, facing cancer, God. We know you to be a healer in a sick room, and we come asking right now that you would heal. Touch our young people, for they are having to learn under very hard situation, God. God, we come asking right now that you would be with every parent, that you would be with every caregiver, that you would strengthen them right now. Strengthen our young people, God. Give them the ability to understand that no weapon formed against them is going to prosper and that they're going to make it through this. They're going to come out of here more than conquerors, God, through you, God. God, we pray for our nation. You've seen the, the presidential debate, and we ask right now that you would move in a mighty way, that you move and, and that you put someone in place that has your heart, that you would put someone in place that, that understand the needs of the people. God, that you would put someone in place that they're concerned about the issues at heart, that they're concerned about racism, they're concerned about the economic disparity, they're concerned about the health issue. God, they're concerned about humanity. And most of all, God, we pray that they would have a relationship with you. God, we come asking right now that you would continue to watch over the Convent Avenue Baptist Church. For we have people who've been out of work for some time and they're trying to figure out how are they going to make it. And God, we need you to make a way. God, we need you to, to allow that every need is met right now, God. God, we thank you in advance for everything that you're getting ready to do. We praise you in advance for everything that you're getting ready to do. God, we're not going to wait till you do it. We're going to start praising you now. God, we lift up our pastor to you right now. Continue to anoint his head. Continue to anoint his mouth, God, so that he may continue to, to give us what you have intended for us to receive. God, help us to walk into purpose. Help us to walk into destiny. Continue to bless the Convent Avenue Baptist Church. God, we're going to give you all the glory, and we're going to give you all the praise in everything that you say and do through us. God, allow us to be a beacon of light in our communities and in our homes. It is in Jesus' name I do pray. Amen and amen.
Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us before his throne of excellent, of grace and mercy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, and dominion and power. And the people of God said, Amen. Brothers and sisters, I am so full and overjoyed at what we just experienced during that worship time. I am so thankful for what God is doing in the lives of the youth of our church and our community. To all of the youth of Convent and this community, thank you so much. God bless you. We love you. We pray for you. And we are here for you. Thank you, Reverend Alamazy Warren, for your leadership today in putting together such a transformative worship experience. Thank you for leading us in such a time as this in the way that you have done on today. And Pastor Vernon Gordon, what can I say? My friend and my brother, thank you for the word on today. You blessed us and God used you in a mighty way. So brothers and sisters, take the time to share this with someone around you. Uh, share it with somebody else who's in your circle of friends, young people, parents, whoever it may be, because this worship experience will be a blessing to anybody who watches it. So God bless you and may he keep you in his care. I'll see you next time. Take care.